Welcome to the second seminar sponsored by the Blue Cross Blue Shield Endowed Chair uh, in partnership with Lister Hill. I'm very, very glad to Lister Hill Center for Health Policy. This would not be possible without uh, their help, especially grateful to Sean McMahon. Thank you also to Julie McDougall, who helps me with all things to do with the endowed chairship. And today we are delighted to have Dr. David Grabowski to speak to us about the extremely pressing issue of what has happened to care for older patients during the COVID pandemic and what the future brings. Uh, I would like to say that there is one CE credit hour of certified public health uh, CPH for attending the seminar, or if you can do not attend it in person, then the archive version will be up on the Blue Cross Blue Shield Endowed Chair website, and you can access that and review that, and you will still get that uh, one credit hour. Um, if you do have questions about that, then Julie McDougall is the person uh, who can answer those questions. Dr. David Grabowski got his uh, PhD from the U Chicago Harris School of Public Policy. Uh, his very first four years, he was assistant professor right here in healthcare organization uh, at UAB uh, when I first joined uh, healthcare organization and policy, there was a two-year overlap between David and myself. And then he moved on to Harvard University. And right now he is professor in the Department of Healthcare Policy at the Harvard Medical School in Boston, Massachusetts. And David's research primarily focuses on the economics of aging with an emphasis on post-acute and long-term care, um, financing, organization, delivery of services, the whole gamut. Uh, he's published over uh, 180 peer-reviewed papers related to these issues. Uh, David is a member of the Medicare Payment Advisory Commission, the MedPAC, uh, which um, advises the US Congress on issues related to the Medicare program. He served as a member of multiple CMS technical expert panels related to post-acute care payment, quality of reporting, and very crucially, he is a member of the CMS Coronavirus Nursing Home Commission. So, I'm going to turn it over to David and what I would like the audience members to know is this is designed as a bit of a conversation. So while David speaks, I am occasionally going to interrupt him to ask for some clarification or his thoughts, a little more in-depth details uh, of what his thoughts on some of the issues. If you have questions or comments, please post them in the Q&A box. Uh, Julie McDougall is going to be monitoring that. Uh, some of the questions we would hold till the end of the talk, but if Julie thinks something is extremely pertinent to what we are discussing right then, she will uh, tell us that question and then we will let David address it. So with that, David, thank you again for being here and it's all yours. Great, thank you, Pia, and hello, everyone. I just uh, scrolled through the participant list and saw many uh, familiar names. So I, my my only regret is that we weren't we aren't all together in person today. Uh, I would love to get a chance to spend some time with everyone. Hopefully, uh, the the pandemic is is coming to an end, and we'll ultimately uh, get get to see one another soon. But it's 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 great to see everyone at least virtually today. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen. Hopefully you guys are seeing that. Does that, does that look good? <laughs> yes, it does. Awesome, awesome. So uh, with my time today, as Pia said, I'm, I'm, I'm basically gonna do two things. I wanna talk about how the pandemic has impacted the care of older adults. And then I wanna talk about kind of going forward, what changes can we expect in terms of how we 
organize, pay, and, and deliver services for older adults. We saw a lot of policy changes during the pandemic. Uh, some of those will be temporary and we'll, we'll go back to business as usual. But I do think there have been some very important changes that, that will ultimately become part of uh, our, our payment delivery and uh, system. And so uh, my, my uh, goal today is to kind of take you through how this has impacted uh, older adults and then think about uh, what, what, what the future uh, might, might look like uh, for, for their care. So just as a kind of a, a, a broad point, the pandemic has impacted uh, healthcare services and, and, and long-term care services for, for older adults, um, really, a, uh, you know, uh, just, just almost globally. Um, you know, hospital care, primary care, uh, post-acute and, and long-term care. And as, as Pia noted at the, at the outset, a lot of my research has focused in post-acute and long-term care. And because of that, um, and, and maybe not so coincidentally, a lot of the impact of uh, the pandemic has actually been on recipients of those services. And so I'll spend the bulk of my time today on, on long-term care and, and nursing homes in particular, which as we all know, have been, been really the, the, the hardest hit part of our uh, healthcare system in terms of the, in terms of the pandemic. So, um, this was a, a, a New York Times piece back in, in May of 25th, uh, 2020. Uh, you can see the title here, Fear of COVID Leads uh, Other Patients to Decline uh, Critical Treatment. And I just wanted to read you uh, a couple of quotes from the, from the piece. Uh, people are saying, so I'm having a heart attack. I'm going to stay home. I'm not going to die in that hospital, said uh, uh, Dr. Marlene Malone. Uh, one woman told the group that every time she has to go in for a scan or blood work, I have a borderline meltdown. We all know um, there, there were serious supply issues during the, during the pandemic, lots of COVID cases early on, uh, but there were also demand side issues as well with lots of patients uh, not receiving uh, services. They, they didn't want to go to the hospital or the doctor or the, or the nursing home. And you so can David, see this. do you think there were also access issues? I mean, especially with older patients and transport, their family not being able to take oh, them to places. A hundred percent with, with uh, family members, uh, you know, probably spread out across the country. Some, some older adults staying in, in their homes. Uh, there, there wasn't a way to get to uh, the, the, these appointments. Many of these appointments uh, probably weren't available. So I think, I think you're right. It, it, it was an access issue um, in, in addition to just uh, some of this being a, a, and some of that being supply side and some of that being demand side. And in terms of supply side, I believe CMS and CDC were actually recommending that anything elective get delayed. Yeah. And, and, that, that's really challenging, right? Because the, the idea of, of something being elective, we can all agree that there's certain procedures that are, are, are truly elective and can be uh, put off to a future time. But a lot of what we categorize as elective, you know, hips and knees, for example, if, if, you, if you critically need a, a hip replacement or a knee replacement, I'll, I'll, although we sort of group it in the elective category, uh, the idea of, of postponing this for six months, a year, that's living with a lot of pain. That has a huge impact on quality of life. Great. Um, and, and as Pia said at the as, as, during the introduction, she's going to jump in periodically. And so um, with, with, with questions, hopefully I, I have answers. We'll see. <laughs> so, um, the, this was uh, just a very simple uh, trend in Medicare spending. And you can see, um, I apologize about all the lines. I just took this from, a, from an ASPE report earlier this year. But you can see that huge decline uh, we were just discussing that, that basically, you know, across the board. So you can see all claims in there, which encompasses uh, all the different healthcare services, but we have inpatient, outpatient, part B, which we just mean physician claims here. Uh, we saw this huge decline. And then for the most part, uh, thing, things came back by the by the summer months there. And I'm just going to show you a series of other kind of break out some of these services to give you a sense of the the, the different uh, trends. But it's, it's a pretty common kind of uh, trend that we're, that we're seeing across these different uh, sectors. So here was the impact on, on hospitalization. This is some work from Berkmeyer and colleagues that was published in Health Affairs. 
you can see just just total admissions there in 2019 relative to kind of overall admissions in 2020 or non-COVID admissions. And, and th there's even a greater decline in, in red there over those summer months. But once again, almost, uh, uh, sorry, over those spring months, but then almost returning uh, by the summer of, of, of 2020 to uh, kind of pre-pandemic levels. So, David, I'm curious, yep. I don't know if you have that data going forward, but I know in July and August, there was a feeling that maybe things were getting better and then November and December, things got slammed again. So do you have any idea whether and, 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 and what's interesting, you're exactly right. And I'll show you some nursing home data that, that actually uh, brings this up almost to the, to the current. And what you see, you're exactly right. We saw that surge during those summer months in the Southeast. So I think it was very regional. And then those winter months, once again, there, there was some decline and that was much more nationally. Not, not to the extent you're seeing here, but definitely there, there was a bit of a decline again uh, that we experienced. I'll, I'll show you some, some nursing home data that kind of yeah, it gives you a sense of how this uh, evolved over the course of the pandemic, but that we, we never quite saw anything, thankfully, again, like that, that early decline, uh, especially here in the, in the Northeast in, in March, April, May. Gotcha. Thank you. And, you know, very similar graph in terms of uh, outpatient visits. So I showed you the, the, the inpatient. This is some data from my colleague, Ativ Marotra, who uh, published this with a, a Commonwealth Fund brief here, and you can just see the, that, that decline during those, those spring months. Um, one of the areas, and Ateev's really been, been a leader in this, is that given the, the sort of decline in, in outpatient uh, use, there was a real opportunity during the, the pandemic to uh, expand telehealth. And uh, the Medicare program made a series of uh, temporary expansions in the programs in terms of the beneficiaries that could use it, the types of services, who could provide it, what was paid, um, the technology that was required, and even the, the patient cost sharing. I won't, I won't read you all of this, but I think the, the, the biggest change was really you know, pre-pandemic, pre, -pandemic, pre uh, the public health emergency, uh, it was really, uh, telehealth was really restricted to uh, rural areas uh, around the U.S. and expanding that to uh, all areas and then not requiring the originating site to be at a clinician's office, for example, but allowing individuals to connect with their uh, clinician from their own home uh, really greatly expanded uh, the use of, of telehealth. And, and you can see that here. This is just the percent, percent change in, in uh, telehealth visits. You can see, once again, those spring months, that, that huge spike. And then some return as people started to go back in person, uh, it, it wasn't that all of the, the service use uh, remained uh, virtual, they're, they're, but, but certainly, uh, there, there's, there's been a pretty consistent uh, use of, of telehealth throughout the, throughout the pandemic. And you can see that here pretty, this is, this is ASPE data once again. Um, this is just primary care visits. And once again, telehealth played a really important role, um, that, that sort of lighter shade of, of blue there in person. It's almost a mirror of the, <laughs> of, of the telehealth as, as in person came down. Um, telehealth, uh, you know, increased, and then there was some decline uh, over the over the summer months, but still, still, you know, uh, quite a bit uh, above those those pre pandemic levels. Pia, you look like you have a question. Yeah, just just curious. So the the graphs that you had shown us earlier, those were inclusive of telehealth visits, right? So even with yeah. telehealth, there were yes. less declines. That's right. That's right. So that was overall, and and it just just shows you we we've seen this incredible sort of decline or temporary decline anyway during those those spring months, but then kind of this shift in the in the type of services that are being delivered, and telehealth played a really important role and. One of one of the sort of takeaways, I'll just say it now because this seems like a like a, a, a good time to kind of get get into this a little bit, is that it, it's really hard to to put the genie back in the bottle. People have really liked telehealth, and so I think there's a real question of of kind of the future of of what the telehealth benefit looks like going forward. But this is one of the areas where I, I think we're going to see uh, a Medicare benefit for for telehealth in the future. 
And I, I doubt that we're going to go back to that pre-PH, pre-pandemic kind of level of, of use. Uh, individuals really like these services. Um, I, I think the key here, and, and um, I, I probably can already sense Pia's next question. She's an economist. She's worried about value and kind of how do we encourage the, the right kinds of telehealth services and discourage the, the sort of wrong kinds? And what do I mean by right and wrong here? The right kinds, of course, are those those higher value services that are benefiting uh, uh, old, older adults, uh, potentially substituting for in-person care. There's probably other services that may be additive. Uh, they may, may not be substituting. They may be more complementary. Uh, and it's it's hard to uh, imagine that there there are all of these all of these telehealth services are, are necessarily improving health. So I, I think one of the real struggles going forward during the pandemic, it made a lot of this sense to expand telehealth. Going forward, how do we ensure that we're getting that, that high value telehealth that's really improving the, the, the healthcare of older adults and discouraging that kind of wasteful uh, additive set of services? I'm going to add in a couple of comments that I've heard from the local Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, people in Alabama. And one of the comments that was made was, yes, the visits, of course, could be done by telehealth, but they were very concerned that labs weren't getting done. So obviously, you know, that's something. Second, I've heard a number of physicians express concern that in telehealth, they were relying heavily on patient reported self-reported conditions, if you will, and were totally missing out on the observational sort of value, the value of the physician being able to look at the patient. And they were concerned about sort of how valid or accurate was the self-reports by the patient. And, and I think you're raising that all important issue of what is it, what does quality look like in, in telehealth? And I think uh, uh, we, uh, a lot's going on during this period, but I, I, there's some really nice research to be done in terms of the expansion of telehealth and how that's impacted the, the, the patients. Uh, absolutely. Um, great. So the, the, another area I wanted to talk about that was really impacted early on during the pandemic was, was post-acute care. So uh, if, you, if you think back to those early months, March, April, May, there was such concern about hospitals, especially intensive care units, just being overwhelmed and hospitals needing, needing to, to discharge uh, patients safely to post-acute care settings. And I, I wrote a, a piece very early on with my colleague at, at Wash U, uh, Karen Joint Maddox, where we thought about kind of what, what post-acute care could do to, to help the, the acute care sector in terms of being a good partner and being a, a potential discharge location. And we didn't like the idea that, that really came up obviously in a big way in New York State uh, of having uh, patients just discharged to any skilled nursing facility. We really wanted uh, to create specialized COVID only facilities that could, that could handle those higher intensity patients uh, with, with COVID. And we thought about, you know, could we create uh, the, the specialized COVID units in, in uh, sort of skilled nursing facilities around the country, either in units or the entire uh, building? Could we, could we retrofit closed facilities? Maybe there's a closed hospital or, or closed SNF. And here in Boston and elsewhere, they even use co convention centers and arenas as uh, potential uh, post-acute care settings. We encourage greater investment in, in home-based care where possible, and then obviously supporting the, the, the workforce. And that'll, that'll, that issue will come up again in, in terms of thinking about long-term care. So this is what we, we recommended. I, I, I don't think we did a very good job in terms of preparing our post-acute care sector. Uh, CMS did, however, uh, introduce uh, a number of waivers within the different post-acute care sectors. I know this looks like a lot of Medicare uh, <laughs> policies here, so I'll, I'll explain what these mean, but all of these policies were basically geared towards one objective, um, allowing greater discharge of, of Medicare uh, patients from the hospital to the different post-acute care settings. And these rules in, in, in normal times, whether it's the, the three-day rule or the 60% rule and on down the list, all of them are about making sure that the individuals coming from the hospital 
to these different post-acute care settings are appropriate. So we want to avoid kind of those that wasteful care. So the three-day three day rule holds that an individual discharged from the hospital to a skilled nursing facility has to have stayed in, in the hospital for, for three midnights. So basically be there for three days. The 60% rule requires that at least 60% of the patients at an inpatient rehab facility, for example, have uh, are, are from 13 conditions. The three hour rule suggests that they, they be able to tolerate three hours of therapy per day. Site neutral payments are about kind of whether the individual spent enough time in the intensive care unit and, and or whether they, they needed ventilator care once, once at the, the LTEC. And the 50% rule is once again about the appropriateness of the patients. Average length of stay is, is, requires that all uh, patients at a long-term care hospital stay for 25 days. So all of these rules are basically about greasing the skits, getting individuals out of the hospital to different post-acute care settings. Um, I, I, I'll say right now, I don't think any of these types of rules are going to be permanent. I'm very optimistic about telehealth being a, a permanent part of, you know, expanded telehealth being a permanent part of the, the Medicare benefits. I, I, I don't know if anyone out there are, operates a post-acute care setting. They don't like it when I say this, but all of these rules were in place for a reason beforehand. They were to try to guard against overuse and, and, and kind of wasteful use of post-acute. I think all of these rules are ultimately coming, coming back uh, post-pandemic. So what did, what did post-acute care use look like? These are some data from, from Avalier Health, uh, just looking at 2020 relative to 2019, and you can see January, February, not, not, not big shifts, but come March, we saw big declines, once again, in hospital care, and that hospital care, that darker shade of blue, led to a real decline in SNF admissions. And some of the decline in SNF admissions was also driven by the fact that Nobody wanted to go to a nursing home during the pandemic. You could say to me, nobody ever wants to go to a nursing home, but that was particularly true during the pandemic. What was interesting, however, and that's in green here, was the rebound of home health. So home health initially saw that same decline in, in terms of uh, discharges, but then really came back uh, towards those summer months because once again, this, this pivot of individuals not wanting to be in institutional post-acute care by recovering from a hip or a knee or a stroke, uh, whatever procedure, um, you, you, you wanna be in your home to the extent you're able to. And we, we did see that, that rebound uh, during the summer months. David, forgive me if I'm getting this, if I'm not quite understanding this. So this is declines in volume compared to the previous year. This is not the change in distribution for the subset who do go to inpatient, because if you go to inpatient, then you're getting discharged to one of these three, right? Uh, By definition. So, so the one on the left is, is the anchoring inpatient stay. So that's why it's, it's so, so you have four different settings after going for an inpatient just means inpatient hospitalization. Okay. And then you're going, you know, either home without any services, or you're you're getting home health, you're getting skilled nursing facility care, inpatient rehab, or LTEC. The two big ticket items are the two you see here: SNF for skilled nursing facility, which uh -huh. is just post-acute nursing home care, and then HH is just home health. And so um, you can see what's happening there with with basically institutional SNF versus home health. Gotcha. Yeah. Great. So I. I'd like to now kind of pivot a little bit. We, we've talked about some of the changes, which I think in some ways uh, were, were much more temporary. I do think telehealth is here to stay, as, as I suggested earlier, but you know, hospital care, outpatient, primary care have largely uh, bounced back. That's not to say that the, the gaps that, that were experienced by beneficiaries didn't have huge impacts on their long-term health. And I think we'll be, we'll be studying this for a long time. What does it mean to uh, miss uh, you know, anything from a primary care appointment to a, um, you know, a cardiology appointment or an oncology appointment? Uh, they're, they're, they're really important or delay a, a, a procedure. I think these are going to have big impacts on health. But um, we, we really felt something much, much different in, in nursing homes. And uh, here, I, I think we saw this from the beginning of the pandemic, and I think it's going to it, you know, persist out over time. And so I, I'd, I'd like to kind of focus a little bit more on this sector in particular, because in many ways, it was the, the hardest hit. And um, oftentimes, researchers will, will sort of throw out their arm trying to pat themselves on the back when they're right. And 
Um, this is a time where my colleague and I, Michael Barnett, really wish we weren't right. Because we said this very early on, you can see the date there, March uh, of, of 2020, we wrote a JAMA Health Forum piece basically suggesting we, we need to protect nursing home residents and their staff, or this is going to be really bad. Uh, and unfortunately, we didn't feel like there was a real system level response to, to protect older adults and their caregivers. And hence, we saw kind of the, the types of numbers I'll, I'll, I'll just show you here. So this is um, both nursing homes and assisted living facilities. So nearly 35,000 facilities nationwide, but we saw almost 1.5 million COVID case, confirmed COVID cases in these 35,000 facilities roughly that led to nearly 184,000 deaths. So, so huge numbers here. Um, roughly a, a third of all COVID deaths occurred among uh, residents of long-term care facilities. Uh, remember, these individuals account for about 1% of our population, but about a third of the, of the deaths from, from COVID. So uh, there was a huge toll uh, uh, among uh, the, these uh, residents of long-term care facilities. Uh, it's important to note that uh, the U.S. is not alone in this. this these are data from ltccovid.org. A colleague of mine, she, she's at uh, the London School of Economics, runs this website. It's been great for doing cross-country comparisons. And you can see um, at this time, the US was at 39%. Because we vaccinated uh, long-term care facility residents relatively early, that rate actually came down. It's about 32% today. But um, you can see that the US is very much an inlier here. We have countries like Canada and Australia that have a really high share of their deaths among long-term care facility residents, and then countries on the left there, uh, largely in Asia, that had had very low rates. And so, um, uh, you know, I, uh, the U.S. looks fairly similar to the to the international average at that time. So I do wonder: in the South Korea, the Singapore's, the Hong Kong's, is it also more because the elderly stay at home with families? That's probably a part of the story, Pia. And then I, I think another, and, and some of these countries just did a better job, I'll point to South Korea, of just keeping it out of the surrounding community and hence were able to protect older adults um, that, that just report, like what we found with a lot of our data here in the US was that the strongest predictor of whether a nursing home had cases is whether there were cases in the surrounding community. It was really hard whether you're, you know, you, you look, there's a real sort of range of, of countries with very different systems here. The, the Netherlands, for example, I'll just point to there, has a state-of-the-art long-term care system. Maybe, maybe some of the best nursing homes in the world uh, some, you know, a really a system that's based around home and community-based services. Yet, when, when when COVID spread in the community, it was very challenging there to to keep it out. Um, I, you know, I, I do think there's something about um, countries that that, as you said, either had kind of smaller nursing homes, uh, like uh, Japan uh, has a lot of smaller home models. They're not on this this chart, but they're um, they they did relatively well. And then, as you suggested, maybe less less of your uh, kind of older population in nursing homes altogether. And I think that that also could help. So the other thing I'm curious about is within the U.S., um, was there substantial variation? I know we've heard all these allegations about New York covering up nursing home deaths and so forth. Yeah, no, that, um, I, I heard a little bit about that too. <laughs> For a while, every every uh, reporter question I got had had a had Cuomo in it, and it was it was uh, that was that was a fun few weeks there. Uh, you know, I, we we've tried to sort of unpack a lot of this as to like what you know what are the what are what are the factors that are predictive here, and uh, you know looking at sort of all these different kind of care, facility characteristics. Um, local spread, as I mentioned earlier, uh, state indicators, that kind of thing. I, the, 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 the most important predictor, once again, was just whether COVID was there. So it, it mattered less if you were a one-star facility or a five-star, whether you were high Medicaid or low Medicaid, for-profit, non-profit. It was really about that community spread. And that, that policy in New York was very unfortunate. It was a, a terrible policy. I, you know, I, I don't know any nursing home researcher that agrees with kind of uh, mandating that that nursing homes admit COVID positive patients, but if you really unpack that, 
it, it didn't contribute to a lot of fatalities there. It really wasn't. It was much more um, the fact that New York just had a lot of community-based cases. And that's what it was the staff asymptomatically bringing it into the facility. And I'll, I'll show you some data and give, give, a, give a case study here in Massachusetts of just how quickly things can, can, can change in a, in a facility. So here, here's a trend I, uh, I mentioned earlier. Uh, unfortunately, CMS didn't mandate early on in the pandemic that, that uh, they report nursing home cases and deaths. So we start in that last week of May of 2020, but you can see things were declining there. And then we had kind of a huge, um, up, uh, yeah, a pretty sizable uptake during the summer, largely in the Sunbelt states. And then we had a decline in kind of the, the, the fall, but then that, that huge spike, Pia, that you mentioned uh, in the winter, and then things looking a lot better. And some of that, that better, that, that decline in, in the most recent um, months is obviously attributable to the, to the vaccinations. And so that's really encouraging. And indeed, just to show you that there's a vaccine effect, or at least suggestive of a vaccine effect, we know that we've all heard about staff being really hesitant about the vaccine. And in, in orange there, you can see staff cases are now above uh, resident cases. And so it's, it's kind of interesting, they've, they've, they've flipped there. And I think a big part of that is just more residents have gotten vaccinated than, than staff. Um, I wanted to show you just kind of the, the impact of uh, COVID on uh, nursing home residents. This was from a piece we did in, in JAMA, once again, led by my uh, colleague Michael Barnett, we um, use electronic health record data for nursing homes in Cleveland, Detroit, and New York City, and just compared um, in orange there, uh, what's, the, what's the fatality rate look like in uh, 2020 relative to the blue line in 2019. At that time, Cleveland really didn't see much difference. Uh, Detroit uh, mortality was 2.2 times higher in that March to May period of 2020 relative to 2019. New York City, where um, uh, we know things uh, uh, were incredibly severe, uh, 4.1 times uh, higher mortality during that period. In that week where the, the spike there is at its apex, in that week alone, fatalities were 10 times uh, higher that week relative to the, that, that same week uh, one year earlier. So, um, you know, there was a, there was a huge, uh, excess mortality burden uh, in, um, among nursing home residents. A lot of efforts to try to contain coronavirus in long-term care facilities. Uh, visitors were uh, not allowed uh, in, across most buildings, uh, no communal dining uh, or activities. And so one of the key points is that uh, it was more than just COVID that impacted nursing home residents. The pandemic itself had a, had a massive impact. So even if Early on, for example, when things were really bad here in, in the Northeast, even if in Alabama, you know, you didn't have COVID in a building, the building was still in lockdown, basically, with no visitors and, and no communal dining uh, or activities. That's going to have a huge impact on the mental health and just the, the quality of life for the residents. And you can see these are some data from Altar. David, I have one question. You mentioned lockdowns. You mentioned no visitors. But Earlier, you had mentioned uh, staff who were asymptomatic. So were there any compulsory testing of staff rules put in place? A absolutely. So um, different states required uh, testing. Um, so for example, New York State at one point required all staff to be tested uh, twice weekly. Um, the problem at that time, however, was it was really challenging to actually do the testing. It was, it was largely PCR-based testing. We didn't have the rapid testing. And so I, I remember at one point talking to an administrator in, in New York State, he and I were talking on a Thursday. Um, he mentioned, you know, I'm gonna have to go get my, my, my second test of the week right after we get off the phone. My first test was on Monday. I still haven't gotten the results back. And so it's just sort of like that, that, that that's kind of a checkbox mentality. That's not actually going to help with prevention. CMS did move over the summer towards providing a lot of rapid tests to uh, nursing homes around the country, uh, more antigen-based testing. The problem there was just the, the facilities based on local rules really didn't use it, Pia, the way they, they should have. And so um, we did a, a piece in JAMA Internal Medicine led by my colleague, Brian McGarry, where um, we found that um, even in those hotspot counties, but, but nationally as well, 
very low use of the of the rapid testing. So um, I, I I guess I'm already in the middle of. It. I was about to say I won't go on my rant about uh, CMS and testing and PPE, but CMS really failed in terms of testing staff and and residents, and then getting personal protective equipment to, to staff. I think those were the kind of system level measures that really would have uh, helped protect a, a, a lot of staff and, and residents around the country. You can see here though, that, that great kind of restrictions that, that occurred, um, uh, incredible uh, you know, from the lack of visitors, um, outside activity, the ability to enjoy fresh air, participate in communal activities or, or eat in the dining room. This had a massive impact on the mental health of nursing home residents. This was a kind of from the survey of 365 residents, um, you know, basically three fourths said they felt lonelier than usual uh, because of the coronavirus restrictions. So, um, I, you know, we've seen a lot of weight loss, failure to thrive. Um, this is not just uh, uh, about getting COVID. This is about everything that, that that's happened over the uh, the last year plus. Um, why did we have to take such an extreme measure of a, of a lockdown? And I just want to give you kind of a, a case study here that I that I was a part of in Massachusetts, where um, some colleagues, I mentioned to you earlier, um, I was advocating for specialized COVID only facilities. And the state of Massachusetts was pursuing that uh, that route by um, going around and testing individuals in nursing homes with the idea if everyone is uh, um, COVID free, we could move them out and actually create a uh, COVID only nursing home. So um, my colleagues were out in uh, late March um, trying to identify uh, facilities and they found one in Wilmington, Massachusetts with 97 residents. There were no known symptomatic cases uh, um, at the time. And so in April 1st, they went in and tested all 97 residents, uh, 52 of them tested positive for COVID. Uh, April 5th, they, they tested the, the kind of remaining uh, 45 residents, 31 of those. So you have 83 of 97 residents testing positive, and, and there was no symptomatic cases as far as this facility knew. Uh, in late March, they also tested 97 staff members, 36 of them tested positive on April 6th. By April 15th, 30 residents had died. So we, we just saw this over and over again in Massachusetts and, and other states where um, we had 20% uh, of our, our nursing homes in the state had 20 or more fatalities. Uh, so it's just, it was really staggering how, how quickly uh, things change. And we, and we my, my colleague Scott Goldberg led this work and we uh, wrote it up for a couple of different journals just to discuss just how, how why, why we needed such uh, protections in place. And if not, things could things could move very quickly. Um, Pia asked earlier about staff. Um, you know, they were really, I think, the vectors in, in many instances in bringing COVID into uh, nursing homes. They would go home to their families every night uh, and then come back in. And as Pia mentioned, without testing, uh, without uh, adequate personal protective equipment, um, many of them brought those cases from the community asymptomatically into the into the nursing home. And uh, as you can see, uh, 577,000 confirmed cases among staff, uh, over 1,900 uh, staff deaths. Um, I'll talk more about that in a moment. Um, once again, kind of the limited support for this workforce, whether it's PPE, testing, hazard pay, uh, all sorts of benefits like paid sick leave, um, staff were uh, hit hit incredibly hard by the by the pandemic, and one of the ways to illustrate this, um, my colleague Brian McGarry was just kind of discovered this this piece. They I guess they run almost every year in uh, different different papers around the country, where they rank the the 25 most dangerous jobs in America. And uh, this is from uh, January 24th of, of 2020. And you can see that at that time, logging workers and commercial fishermen were the most dangerous jobs in America. Um, logging workers, almost 100, 100 deaths per, per 100,000 workers. And so Brian kind of did the calculation um, with, uh, with nursing home workers. And uh, we were able to determine that, you know, based on the kind of pace of, uh, of fatalities and if those continued, uh, we, we wrote a piece uh, for the Washington Post in, in July of, of 2020 suggesting, 
you know, nursing home uh, worker is the most dangerous job in America and uh, almost double the, the fatality rate relative to logging workers and, and, and commercial fishermen. So um, th this, this pandemic was incredibly uh, hard on, on nursing home staff. I'll also say it was really tough on uh, nursing homes financially. I showed you some of the kind of utilization data earlier for hospitals and, and other sectors, but uh, very similar for, for um, skilled nursing facilities. Here's uh, data uh, from that same JAMA piece uh, from, I showed you from earlier, Cleveland, Detroit, and New York City. And you can see kind of first on the top there, just the admissions. Um, New York kind of came back maybe because of that uh, mandate, uh, but, but ultimately came down. But in all three markets, uh, census along the bottom panel was falling. And we, we've seen that continue uh, throughout, the, throughout the pandemic, that utilization is, is down and it's, it's continued to stay down. And one of the points I'd like to kind of raise here in the discussion is, what does this mean long term? Are people going to go back and actually want to use uh, nursing homes in the future? So let me say a few more remarks and then I'll definitely uh, open it up for uh, some, some questions and comments. But uh, I, you know, one, of, one of my favorite quotes, my, my colleague Barb Bowers you know, described uh, the pandemic and, and COVID in nursing homes as a crisis on top of a crisis. Uh, you know, we, we've already been talking about just the number of cases and the mortality, uh, the deaths from, from COVID. Um, the impact it's had on residents, on caregivers, and just on, on, the, on the market uh, as a whole. But then you layer this on top of what's been our longstanding crisis. And Pia mentioned that I, I was on faculty at, at UAB for five years. My, my job market paper when I first came to UAB was on low Medicaid payment and, and nursing home quality. So this isn't a, I, I'll say that that wasn't a recent presentation. This has been a longstanding issue around uh, Low, low Medicaid payment and just uh, what, what impact that has on overall quality. Um, we've seen poor quality, low staffing in a lot of buildings around the country, low wages for, for the workforce and huge disparities. Uh, so David, one question here, since you're talking about low staffing, low pay, uh, one of the things I know COVID did was it really disrupted the supply of foreign workers. Um, is that a significant component of the nursing home staff? It, it is. So the estimates that we've seen, it, it, it's about a third of all um, uh, workers in nursing homes, and especially those who are doing the direct caregiving, are, are immigrants. And so this is hugely important. And one, one of my sayings is like, uh, immigration policy is long-term care policy, because if you do not kind of allow a, a, a steady stream of immigrants here, you're going to impact uh, the, the, the supply of, of, of nursing home workers and ultimately the quality. And this, it, it, it's, it's interesting, we've been doing some work. I've been working some with uh, Brian McGarry, once again, who I mentioned earlier at Rochester and John Gruber at MIT. And we've been trying to do some work just tying kind of the flow of immigrants to the supply of uh, nursing home workers. And not surprisingly, Pia, exactly as that, that share describes, it's really important, um, the, the sort of flow of, of immigrants towards having kind of enough staff in the building. Uh, so um, th this, th that, that work kind of predates uh, the pandemic, but I think coming out of the pandemic and our ability to, you know, the, the, the Trump administration immigration policy would have obviously impacted this too, but even just um, the the lack of of immigrants over the you know past year plus with the with the pandemic, this is going to have a big kind of uh, uh, impact on on the supply of workers. Mm -hmm. Because I imagine I don't know if any of them are seasonal, but the seasonal workforce yeah. is the one that's basically stopped coming. Right, right. And it's it's really interesting, you know, if you go to different, I'm certain this is true in Birmingham, but it, it's, it's true here, like you can go to a nursing home, um, one of the Harvard affiliated ones, every kind of caregiver at this one nursing home I'm thinking about is from Haiti. And it's like the entire workforce. And it's almost, you know, it's, 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 it's a, it's, it, there's a, there's a network there. And if you were to cut off that, so it's just that that's their entire <laughs> flow of workers into that building. And so it's going to have a huge impact on uh, the ability to, to, to staff these, these, uh, the, these facilities. Um, far too many of these buildings, just going down the list here, are, are very institutional. They look like hospitals. They don't look like somebody's home. Uh, 
they rarely have doctors in the building. Uh, the regulatory model in many respects is broken. And it's very hard for consumers to go on nursing home compare or other report cards and kind of suss out who are the, who are the good, good providers and who are the bad ones. And then there's a real limited lack of financial transparency too, where we often don't know if nursing homes are putting those dollars back into direct care. There's been a lot of accusations of late about uh, private equity ownership and related party transactions. And so um, it's been very hard for uh, nursing homes to, um, uh, nursing home residents to, to um, uh, kind of ascertain whether the, the dollars are actually flowing where they think they're flowing. Um, I wrote a piece recently, it's interesting, Pia asked about kind of staff just now, because that, that, that's that been really on the front of my mind. Um, the point of this piece, it was, it was just back in March, but I was trying to think about, we know nursing homes need a lot of work. I've been showing you lots of problems they had during the pandemic. A lot of this is gonna persist. Um, taking a big institutional building and making it a small home model, that takes a lot of capital. That, that's, that's a longer run endeavor, but um, improving the staff could be done relatively quickly. It just takes money largely Medicaid money to, to, to make this happen. Um, that's probably why it hasn't happened to date. But I, I offered a lot of ideas in this Politico piece about how you might kind of improve uh, the, the, um, you know, the workforce. And, you know, we could think about minimum staffing standards, increasing the, the, the wages, setting up wage floors and benefits, um, raising Medicaid reimbursement to actually pay for this. Uh, having increased financial transparency such that we know the dollars are, are going where we think they're 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 going um, and then also just improving the the jobs themselves allowing kind of career ladders um, giving more empowerment to direct care staff uh, staff in most buildings don't don't have a lot of autonomy uh, they're told what to do it's not a uh, I, I think when I when I've spoken to staff over the years they they really love working with older adults but they hate everything else about being in, in nursing homes and about their job and they, they don't really feel valued and I think that's a big part of the reason we've seen vaccination rates uh, being so low among staff they don't they don't trust leadership in these buildings and they're, 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 there's um, a real need to improve kind of the the um, the way in which we value this workforce. Do the staff have health insurance? Some do, but a lot don't, Pia. And it's it's really like uh, the the benefits. It's it's really amazing. Like they they um, you know many of them lacked life insurance, unfortunately, during the pandemic. Many of them lacked um, health insurance. It was just there there wasn't. There's not a, a rich set of benefits. Some places do, but um, many don't, unfortunately. And that's something that that you know hopefully we can. Uh, that'll change coming out of this is just I, I, I think if anything we we put a lot more attention on uh, on on this workforce. Um, you know we've we've often paid them close to minimum wage. It's largely female, as we mentioned earlier. Uh, a lot of immigrants, a lot of minorities. It, it's 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 not a it's not a workforce. I think we've properly valued. I've I've written a lot about what is the future of a nursing home look like. Um, uh, you know, whether it's a, um, the piece I, I did in JAMA with, with Vince Moore, uh, a Commonwealth Fund brief that I wrote, um, or my piece with Joe Oslander. Let me focus on the, on the Commonwealth Fund uh, piece and just kind of talk you through some of the, the steps that I see are ways that we could really, um, I think, improve uh, care in this country. Uh, some of these are, are, are smaller and, and more short term. Some of these are, are bolder and, and, and likely longer term. Currently, we have two major public payers, Medicare paying for that post-acute short stay. Medicare is a very generous payer. Then we have Medicaid paying for most of the long stay services um, for individuals who are chronically ill. Medicaid is not a very generous payer in most states. Um, this cross subsidization from Medicare to Medicaid is really inefficient for lots of reasons. We need to realign uh, payments across both programs to, to better approximate costs. We need policies, once again, to get doctors on site in, in, in most nursing homes around the country. Uh, physicians are largely missing in action. Once again, we, we need to support staff, whether that's through wage floors or wage pass-throughs, um, minimum staffing standards, um, improving the, the transparency of what's happening, whether it's it's resident satisfaction surveys, um, just, just better kind of quality measurements such that uh, the report cards are, are, are much more meaningful than, the, than um, they currently are. Um, we 
uh, I think have a broken regulatory model right now in, in nursing homes that needs both better enforcement, but also um, ways of, of connecting kind of the, the um, activities of the regulator with, with quality improvement. Um, we have far too few um, small home models. I did an evaluation several years ago, what's called a greenhouse home. There's actually one uh, in, in Birmingham. I actually got to, to, to visit it as part of that, that study. Um, it's, it's a really uh, beautiful facility there. Um, I, I, you know, I, I think these, these eight to 12 person homes, the, the, it has a kitchen, the food is cooked right there on site. It really, you know, the residents have much greater autonomy over their lives. The staff are, are, are better valued and better paid. Um, I, it doesn't have to be a greenhouse, but that kind of model is actually such a, a better way to, to deliver uh, nursing home services for older adults than kind of the, the traditional, very institutional models that I don't think any of us really uh, wanna, wanna uh, live or, or have a family member receive care at. We need beyond just uh, you know, investing in, in nursing homes, we need to invest in home and community-based services. And a final idea is, is some sort of national long-term care benefit. Uh, historically, we've had individuals sort of pay privately or out of pocket who are wealthier and then Medicaid sort of serves as, as insurance for individuals uh, who meet the income and asset thresholds. But there's this forgotten middle that it's really, you're, you're, you're too wealthy for Medicaid yet not wealthy enough to really buy a lot of the options that are, that are out there. And how, how do we think about a, a, a national long-term care benefit I was much more blunt in a piece I did for, for Nature Aging. That was a long list. I'll just show you, if, if, if I had to boil it down, if, if you don't remember anything else about what we should do with long-term care, let's invest in home and community-based care. That's where people want care. And let's transform nursing homes from these big institutional settings down to these uh, uh, smaller home models. Um, thankfully, we are seeing incredible um, investment right now, or at least discussion of investment and home and community-based services. It's a key part, uh, $400 billion part of uh, uh, the Biden infrastructure bill. Um, that's the good news. Uh, the, the, the less clear part is how that money would actually be spent. This I just pulled out a Kaiser Family Foundation um, slide about how we might spend the money, whether it's expanding money follows the per person, supporting direct caregivers, uh, serving more, you know, get, you know, expanding the coverage through the through the benefit. There, there, there's there's a lot of different ways to spend this, and hopefully, uh, we we uh, we actually do go forward with the, these kinds of expansions. So, uh, oh, go ahead, Pia, and then I was going to. No, uh, well, maybe this is more of a sort of final question to think about. So, the, what I have read, and again, I'm just sort of when a headline catches my eye. The biggest concern around nursing home care uh, for families seemed to be less of the safety issue and more of all of a sudden I could no longer visit my parent in the nursing home and they were lonely and depressed. So the necessary part, which was the lockdown, seemed to be the one that was most traumatic to families and the reason why most of them are wondering if they ever want to do nursing home. Uh, this is a huge point. Um, we have this almost pendulum, Pia, I think on the one side is let's, let's keep residents safe. And on the other hand, let's, let's sort of maintain their dignity and quality of life and autonomy. And I, I think we swung the pendulum during the pandemic way too far towards safety and sort of forgot about these sort of basic rights that, that residents had. I've shown you a couple of the pieces I, I wrote during the pandemic. The, the, the piece that got the biggest response, and this won't surprise you based on what you just asked, Pia, um, we wrote a piece, once again, in the Washington Post, just talking about, we need to reopen nursing homes. We need to have essential care partners that can go into the facilities, do this safely, of course, with personal protective equipment, testing, but there's a way to like, like why can staff come in and out every day, but somebody's spouse can't. And, and so it's just, um, wanting to, to sort of have these essential care partners uh, be able to come and go. And of all the pieces I wrote during the pandemic, that was the one that resonated the most. People were just so uh, passionate about it. We got a lot of uh, emails and comments and that, you know, th th this issue. And I'll, I'll say I, as part of the, during the pandemic, I testified twice to Congress on uh, nursing homes and COVID on both of those panels was a family member. And Pia, 
they, they their voice was the strongest. You know, it's just like, I, you know, and exactly what you said, less concerned about kind of the safety and more concerned that I couldn't see mom every day. And that's really what kind of stuck with them. Um, so so just to wrap up here, and then I, then I want to answer any questions that folks have, but um, how will the, the what, so what's going to be permanent about, I, th I think, uh, rule changes coming out of this pandemic? I think telemedicine is here to stay. I, I don't think we're going back on that. I, I think once, in addition to that, we're going to see more care delivered in home and, and, and less in uh, kind of institutions. Um, I don't think we're going to see uh, maintenance of any of those kind of post-acute care rules uh, that were relaxed during during the pandemic. I think long-term care, we're only going to see more home and community-based services uh, and, and less institutional care. And I have a question mark here because the biggest one to me is, Will we, will we actually go forward with reimagining uh, nursing home care? So I will say thank you on, on that point, P, and I'm happy to, to take any kind of questions or, or, or comments, but thanks again so much for uh, in, in inviting me today. Thank you. I see there are several questions in the Q&A box. Uh, Julie, do you want to uh, share some of them? I think the first one I'll pose is one that came uh, earlier on and it's what are some lessons the U.S. nursing homes have learned from the rest of the world? Yeah, it's a great question, and I, I I don't think we have the amount of learning that that we that we need to have. So I I, I think like a lot of sectors, we're we're somewhat silo. We each have our own kind of institutional features. You know, we have Medicaid and we have Medicare, but I I, I do think a lot of the, the the models that we're seeing in other countries, whether it's small home models. Um, one of the models I really like in Japan is they integrate nursing homes in the community. So here in the U.S., all too often, nursing homes are separate from the surrounding neighborhoods or communities. And that kind of um, integration, if you will, to that, that nursing homes aren't an end of life or anything like that, but a part of life and trying, trying to integrate that, that family side of it. So th those are lessons. I, I think another really important lesson that I, that I saw, and I, I visited the Netherlands prior to the pandemic and visited some nursing homes. Uh, and I, I think a, a, a big lesson there was just staffing. There were a lot more staff and they were a lot better paid. So I, I think these smaller home models, investment in staff, and then integration of nursing homes into uh, communities. All right, there was uh, another question that had to do with uh, what has been the impact of COVID on independent living facilities? Yeah. Uh, so, well, yeah. this, this uh, um, attendee said that they seem to have been ignored in vaccination efforts, for example. So some independent living got sort of bundled in. So we did sort of nursing homes and then assisted living. And to the extent that independent living was on a common campus, I, I, they did have vaccine clinics, but the, the questioner is exactly right. If you had a standalone sort of independent living community, which could also could be at risk, you're not as closely um, uh, congregated as a nursing home, but you still have a lot of older adults. Um, I, I, I wish we had prioritized other other settings in terms of the, the federal vaccine clinic because um, I, I, we have a lot less data. And I think this is a really important point. Nursing homes, uh, it was a terrible situation during the pandemic, but we also should acknowledge we have really good data there. We have less good data with assisted living. We know there were some problems there, but then what happened in the home and community, what happened in independent living, we, we lack a lot of the data. And so our, our hope is that as we get more Medicare claims and we're able to sort of go back and, and study and hopefully uh, group individuals, we'll, we'll, we'll get more of that story. There was another question that had to do with whether or not you felt that certificate of need reform and competition was a viable strategy to improve quality um, or would removing um, certificate of need, would, would that undermine um, the prioritization of, of HB, uh, HCBS? Yeah, I, 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 I would love to see. So I've been on this soapbox. I wonder if Mike Morrissey or somebody asked this, but um, I, I've been on this soapbox since I was at UAB. I actually testified uh, to the legislature in Alabama about a CON application. I, I've never been a big fan of these, these constraints, especially with, with nursing homes where um, they keep out kind of those innovators uh, and those, those um, you know, 
new kind of, uh, I, I think, interesting nursing homes that are that are going to kind of break the the mold that we have here currently. So I I, I think CON is is a an impediment, um, not not a um, uh, kind of a, 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 a support to um, reforming long term care and. I think right now occupancy rates are way down, and so this is a great time to repeal CON. Let let some of the the, the worst providers go out of business. Let 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 new entrants come in, and I, I think we're going to see that pivot to home and community based services. We don't we don't need CON to do that. The only people advocating for CON are those that are kind of running nursing homes. You spoke like an economist there. <laughs> <laughs> I certainly didn't speak like a politician. I'm not going to get any votes from nursing home operators. So, um. Well, there are um, a few other questions. Yeah, but, I'm happy to keep um, going. Well, given the fact that it's after two, um, <laughs> it, it's a little difficult for me to go through the, the questions that have been posed and sort of prioritize out maybe the you one or two more. You want me to take more. a look? Sure. Okay, I'll, I'll take a... Uh, Quick look here. So one of the comments that was made here is CMS changed testing guidelines for staff, but is this ill-advised without matching guidance uh, on vaccination rates? Yeah, and this is this is an area where finally uh, CMS has come around and. So there's been a lot of places where I think we've been too slow with the data. And you saw earlier, my, my sort of trend there started that last week of May. We were on CMS from the beginning, publicize the data, collect the data, we, we need the data. And I think they were uh, very reluctant to put more reporting burden on nursing homes, but we really need this information and we need it now about vaccinations. And I said, right as the rollout started, we need to know which facilities have vaccinations. Consumers are gonna want this information, but from a public health standpoint, how do we know where we need to focus? Uh, if, if all um, we, we have to go on is kind of a numerator, we never got kind of the denominator of how many uh, individuals at this particular facility have been vaccinated. So um, I, I think finally they've made this announcement that we're going to, to actually get um, more uh, data at, a, at the facility level, finally. And I, I think that's really going to help with this issue going forward. I know it's not popular, once again, with nursing homes, but I, I really think um, if, if we're going to help them to, to vaccinate the staff, we, we, we need to see these data. Mm -hmm. And there's one question which I maybe don't, we can't answer it right now, but maybe <laughs> this is the you and Mike Morrissey collaboration later, which is what impact will it be to insurance companies to write long-term care policy with the drop of nursing home and oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, the, the future of long-term <laughs> care insurance, that, that's probably, yeah, I'll, I'll let Mike figure that out. I don't know where the, the future of that industry goes. It, it was a struggle. So just as background for those of you um, unlike health insurance, which you know uh, ha is, is very robust, the long-term care insurance market is very narrow. Um, less than five percent of older adults have private long-term care insurance. Certainly, with this pandemic, it, it, there's good news in that you know if you had long-term care insurance, it could cover assisted living, it could cover home and community-based services. So you know maybe there's a uh, kind of a demand side, but the supply side is, is very different today than it was pre-pandemic. And so I, I don't, I have no idea what the contract or what the future of that. And certainly the recommendation I made around growing the, um, the some sort of national long-term care benefit would obviously crowd out any kind of private market that that's emerged there today. Well, we are a full five minutes past our time. And so, and thank you everyone. Thank you for the many positive comments, David. We have several comments. That's a great <laughs> talk and huge thanks. So thank you very much, everybody. Uh, the recording of this entire seminar will be up uh, on the uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield uh, Endowed Chair website uh, as soon as we can have it up there. And uh, you're welcome to revisit and review again. Uh, thank you, Lister Hill Center, for helping us host this. Thank you, Julie, for all your help. And David, thank you once again so much. Thanks, everyone. Take care. Take care.